Bible tonight, I'd like for you to turn with me to the book of Luke, book of Luke chapter number 15, Luke chapter number 15. Once you find your place in Luke 15, if you're willing and able to stand together, I want to look at one of these uh, parables tonight as we are reminded that in the Lord's economy that every single one matters and every single one has value. Luke chapter 15 tonight, and I want you to look with me at the parable of the lost coin, and that's found beginning in verse number 8. Luke chapter 15, verse 8, the Word of God says, Either what woman having ten pieces of silver... If she lose one piece, doth not light a candle, and sweep the house, and seek diligently till she find it. And when she hath found it, she calleth her friends and her neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I had lost. Verse 10, Likewise I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. Amen. Brother Jimmy, would you pray for us, please, sir? Seated. Uh, when we come to Luke chapter number 15, we often have heard this chapter referred to as God's lost and found chapter. There's something that's been lost and out of its place, and then it has been found, restored back to its proper place, and then there's a rejoicing that takes place. Now, when we think about tonight the importance of individuals, and we know that in God's economy that every single one has value, and that every single individual does matter. Uh, it's interesting uh, tonight that uh, as we read this mission letter that uh, there's a lot of different questions I like to ask missionaries when I have the opportunity uh, to meet them. And one of the questions is I often ask them is uh, how did you determine where that you was going to serve? And I'm always uh, wanting to hear, well, God put it in my heart to go here and God put it in our, and, and all this. But uh, there have been times in the past and not anything that's happened recently but I've had individuals tell me, and this is back years ago, I remember one individual in particular, and he said this, uh, he said that we just felt like that we should go to certain uh, country and said that we didn't know anything about that country, so we took and we started doing all kinds of Google searches and uh, we looked at population and census and all this, and we determined uh, what uh, the area was of the greatest population, and we determined that that would be the area of greatest need. Now, when I heard that, it sounded good in theory, but really, in reality, uh, that uh, we don't have the liberty to pick and choose where we serve God. Uh, that it's Him that calls us. It's Him that places us. It's Him that uh, puts us where we're to be. And who's to say the area of the greatest need is the area of the largest population? I mean, after all, you go back to the book of Acts and you find that there's Philip. And Philip's being diligently and proclaiming the Word of God, and there's souls being saved, there's a revival that's taking place, and there's a mass movement uh, of individuals getting their hearts right, and one day the Holy Spirit comes to Philip and says, you need to leave here and go down to the desert. That don't make a lot of sense. Philip goes down there in obedience, and when he gets down there, uh, there's a, a little chariot coming by, and it was the uh, the Queen Candace, uh, her uh, treasurer, the eunuch, was on that uh, uh, little chariot coming through, and the Lord told Philip to go and join himself to that chariot, and he did, and, and this uh, man was reading uh, the book of Isaiah, and he asked him, he said, understand what thou readest, and he said, how can I except some man show me, and the word of God says that Philip took the same scripture and preached to him Jesus, because that's what it was all about, uh, Isaiah 50, and on and on, 
And he said, what doth hinder me to be baptized? He said, if thou believest, you may. and they poured the chariot over, and he was baptized. What are you saying, preacher? I'm saying God took Philip from an area of a great population of souls being saved uh, down to the desert uh, to witness to one individual. You know why? Because every single one matters when it comes to God's economy. Uh, you thought it would think about Jesus and his earthly ministry. And Jesus says, all right, men, said, uh, we got to stop here because I must needs go through Samaria. Oh, that don't make sense. Why? Because the Jews and Samaritans, they don't have dealings with one another. That These Samaritans are half-breeds, and, and we look down on them, and uh, we don't uh, look at them and value them like everybody else. And Jesus said, that might be the way you look at them, but that's not the way I look at them. And he said, there's a woman down there that knows some things about religion, uh, but what she needs to know is some things about a relationship. Uh, she's more concerned about where you worship than who you are to worship. And I need to go down there and point out to her that her biggest need uh, is a, a the problem of the heart that is a problem of sin. And Jesus goes down and spends time dealing with her and gets on a one-on-one -on -one basis of evangelism and begins to uh, meet with her where the rubber meets the road. And every time that she tries to derail the subject and start talking about something else, Jesus brings her right back. You ever notice that when you go to witness somebody and as soon as conviction starts setting in, all of a sudden they want to talk about something out in left field. They want to ask you some kind of Bible question that don't have a thing in the world to do with salvation and what you're dealing with. You say, preacher, what do you do? I just do what Jesus did. I bring them right back to what matters and get back to the most important part, and that is the salvation of their soul. Uh, but after Jesus had finished... Uh, that she runs into town, uh, a different woman, and she says, come see a man who told me all things ever I did. Is not this the Christ? And her life was changed. Uh, why? Because Jesus cares about every single individual because every single one matters. Uh, when you think about uh, that Jesus is on the board of that ship and they're out down the Sea of Galilee and he tells, uh, goes over to uh, Gadara, the area of the Gadarenes. And uh, there's a man over there that's been bound in fetters and chains, and he's uh, all messed up, and he's possessed with a, a legion of demons. Uh, and uh, the Lord Jesus goes over and begins to deal with him, and before it's over, uh, that he's been delivered. And uh, when he gets there, that man's in bad shape, but before Jesus leaves, a man's sitting at Jesus' feet, and he's clothed, and then he's, he's in his right mind. Why? Because he's had a divine encounter with the Lord and Master, Jesus Christ, who saved him and delivered him from his torment, and the only one that could. Do you know why Jesus went over there? I don't find any other work that he ever done there, not saying that he didn't, but I can tell you what I do understand is he went there because he cared about this individual. Amen. He couldn't deliver himself, but he could be delivered. Now, when I think about these parables tonight, that they remind us of the importance of of everyone to the Lord. Uh, I remember reading one time, it's been some time ago, that D.L. Moody, one of the great preachers of the past, that he spoke about uh, that there was a time in his life that he was the director of the Sunday schools that was in Chicago uh, in a great, um, a, a large circumference area. There was a lot of different churches that had Sunday school, and, and he was the director over all these different churches' Sunday school programs. And uh, he had found out as he was taking role in attendance, that there was one little young boy uh, that he lived on one side of town, but he was traveling many, many miles and going all the way across uh, Chicago, uh, the city, uh, to another part of the city to go to a church. And uh, D.L. Moody went and met with this boy, and he told him, he said, young man, said, I, you know, I'm uh, excited about your enthusiasm and your drive. And, and he said, seeing the distance that you travel is amazing and that type of sacrifice. And he said, but uh, I don't know if you know this, but there's some churches right around your area that are good, solid churches, and they have a good Sunday school, and uh, they'd love to have you. And he said, sir, he said, I know about those Sunday schools, and I know about those churches. He said, well, if that's the case, then why would you travel so many miles and go all the way across the city uh, to a church over there? He said, this is why. He said, because those people over there really love me. The saying is that nobody cares how much you know until they first of all come to know how much you care. And we'd have to agree that nobody ever cared for sinners and nobody ever cared for you and nobody ever cared for me like Jesus cares for us and truly he cared. As a matter of fact, we find that the Lord Jesus attracted sinners while the self-righteous, religious, looking down their nose Pharisees repelled them. The question is tonight, do we attract sinners or do we repel sinners? 
individually, do we attract them or do we repel them? As a church, do we attract them or do we repel them? And some say, oh, we don't want to be a part of a church that attracts sinners. Why not? Because that's the type of person Christ is, and that's what kind of church His is to be. And you say, well, we don't want to become worldly to attract sinners. Who said you had to be worldly to attract sinners? They're not looking for what they already have. They're looking for something they don't have. They're looking for something different. They want to investigate our lives and find out what it is that gives us joy uh, when our life's upside down, what gives us hope whenever everything seems hopeless. They're looking to find out what the difference is in our life, and they find out it's not what, but it's who. It's Jesus Christ. Uh, what's interesting to me uh, is uh, when Jesus, uh, whenever he came uh, and, and uh, he attracted lost sinners, uh, that uh, the way he attracted them, listen, he never catered unto them. I'm talking about trying to figure out some way to... It wasn't that. We study his life and ministry. He never condoned their sin or sinful lifestyle. Never find that. Why? Because he's perfect, holy, righteous God. Matter of fact, he never changed his message because of those that was in his presence. He always preached the same message. And it was always convicting. It was always dealing with sin. And the need to be cleansed and the need. And you say, well, if he didn't uh, uh, cater to them and if he didn't uh, uh, condone their sin and if uh, he didn't uh, change his message, then how did he attract them? I'll tell you how he attracted them because he cared for them. Because he cared about them. That's why a little boy said, I go down there because I know they love me down there. Jesus, he knew that they were hurting. He knew the answer to their problems. He knew what they needed was deliverance and a relationship with Him. Uh, he knew that He could help them. He knew that He could change their lives. Uh, he had compassion on them. And if our Lord and Savior had that same kind of vision towards those that He looked out upon, that don't you think you and I, to be Christ-like, need to have that same mindset? Rather than looking down our face and, oh, I'm glad, thank God, I'm not like other men are. I'm glad I'm not this. I'm glad I'm not that. All, all this. Uh, you and I can say, oh, God, be merciful unto me, a sinner. And Lord, if it wasn't for your grace, I'd be in the same condition. And the same grace and the same love and the same blood that saved me and cleansed me uh, and uh, has given me hope and help is the same thing that that individual needs. And what they need today is not to be pushed down further. They need somebody to come to them and love them and tell them that somebody loved them enough that he left heaven and, and went to Calvary and died for their sin and will deliver them and change their life if they all simply trust him by faith. I tell you this, he understood their needs. Now notice that the religious Pharisees and the scribes, they, they didn't like this about Jesus. Verse number one, then drew near unto him <clears throat> all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. You see what's happening? These publicans and sinners, they're coming in. <clears throat> they're attracted to him. Why? Because he cared for them. And we find the religious crowd in verse number 2. And the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. They say he, he, he had fellowships of sinners. He even eats with them. Uh, you know what the Jewish leaders of that day couldn't understand? Is they couldn't understand that's why Jesus came. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. And they were so blinded in their religion that they didn't understand that they were one of the ones that Jesus came to seek and to save and redeem. Amen. They were uh, themselves blind to the fact that they were lost. Now in these parables we uh, find that the Lord makes it clear that God welcomes repentant sinners. Uh, God changes uh, lives and there's rejoicing that takes place when a sinner has been redeemed and put back in the proper place and been cleaned up and uh, of usefulness unto God. The message is the same. Something's lost, it's found, and then there's rejoicing. Uh, we find that there's the uh, lost sheep and the lost silver uh, that speaks about uh, the, uh, the desire of God, uh, of the importance of every single one that has value unto Him, that every single one matters. Uh, you find that the good shepherd would leave the 90 and 9 to go and to seek out and to deliver and bring back that one sheep that had went astray. Now, I tell you this, I'm glad the Lord would leave the 90 and 9 to go after that one lost. Amen. I'm glad that not only does he save us, but there's times he has to go back and get us and restore us back to the fold. Because we've foolishly wandered away from him and got out of, uh, out of bounds. And he comes to us and brings us back and restores us back to the fold where we needed to be all along. We find that when it comes to this woman, uh, that uh, she uh, loses a piece of silver. 
Uh, the sheep was one in 100, the silver is one in 10, uh, but the message is still the same, that every single one matters. Uh, now this evening, as we observe this woman, we see her going to great lengths to find this coin and restore it back to its proper place. Uh, as we consider the message tonight that every single one matters, there's a couple of things that I want to uh, point out from this parable. By the way, what is a parable, preacher? It's, a, it's an earthly story with heavenly and spiritual meaning and application. Things that you and I can relate to, but things that have spiritual significance. Uh, we find that this uh, coin, this silver, was precious to this woman. Uh, we say that because in that day, in that culture, that uh, often that uh, a woman would have a headband that was made up of a lot of coins that was uh, strung together and she'd wear them upon her head. That traditionally what would happen is whenever uh, a woman was being married, that her father would take and put together a headband and he would give it to her on her wedding day. It was something that had a, a, a large amount of value because it served at several different areas of function. Uh, one of those areas is, first of all, it declared her status as a married woman. When she had on this headband, it was letting society know that this woman uh, was no longer on the market. She was no longer available. That she'd already been spoken for, she'd already uh, been uh, committed to and made a commitment. It's kind of like you and I that put a wedding band on. That's supposed to be a message to society that we already have somebody. Uh, now, what's sad today is that don't mean a whole lot to people. But it means something to me. Why? Because I'll never... Uh, made a covenant with my wife. It wasn't just a covenant between her and I. It was a covenant between her and I and the Lord. And uh, the, we, we go on and we think about that uh, it was uh, declared uh, uh, her marriage status. Uh, and uh, these coins were also uh, a symbol and display of a woman's independence. Uh, what it was saying is often in those days that a man would, if he got dissatisfied with his wife, uh, that sometimes what he would do is he would either uh, want her to put up with his foolish behavior and, and actions and say, well, what are you going to do? Uh, you're going to leave. You can't afford to make it on your own, that you're stuck in this relationship, uh, that I can be uh, unfaithful to you if I want to. And uh, as a matter of fact, if I want to, if, if I get upset with you, I can divorce you. I can write you a bill of divorcement and I can put you away for whatever. In those days, it was crazy because there was people that was writing bills of divorcement uh, and uh, they were divorcing their spouses over the way they cooked their food. You know how foolish that is. But you know today that when it comes to exchanging vows, there's a lot of folk that don't take it serious. And I'm not saying that things don't happen down the road, but what I am saying uh, is that young people and uh, middle-aged and older alike need to understand uh, that, uh, uh, that there's an importance of exchanging vows. But uh, what would happen is this woman, if uh, uh, her husband decided that one day he was going to write her a bill of divorcement and divorce her, uh, that she didn't have to worry so much because that at least she had enough to get her by for a little while in order to get a fresh start because her father uh, had made some provision to take care of her. Uh, and uh, these headbands were often uh, made up uh, of uh, uh, several different coins, uh, dozens of coins, and each one of them was equivalent to a, a day's wages. And uh, as uh, they were equivalent to a day's wages, if she needed to, she could cash them in and she could take and make it for a little while. But now with hers only having 10 in it, it was a message that, first of all, that she probably came from a pretty less fortunate background. Her family was probably a little less well off than some of the others. Uh, and that, that tells us also why that if one of them was missing, why that she took it so serious is because every one of them had a special importance and value unto them. Also, it was used to identify sinful uh, uh, behavior and, and sinful lifestyle. You say, what do you mean, preacher? Sometimes if a woman had been guilty of uh, infidelity and had been an adulteress, that one of those uh, coins would be removed and it was a status uh, to society that this woman had been unfaithful. You know what, it would be embarrassing and humiliating to have a big, nice, beautiful headband and one of those coins missing and everybody think that you'd been guilty of uh, uh, committing adultery and all the while that you hadn't been. It simply one had fallen out and that's what you'd want to do is find that and make sure you put it back because it brought shame and reproach. Now, when we think about this, uh, these coins were used to bring glory and honor to the bride. But as long as one of them was missing, that it was a, a mark on her beauty, uh, that it was a mar, and she was incomplete and, and humiliated and embarrassed, that's why that it was very precious. Uh, however, that uh, this coin had absolutely no value to her while it was gone. 
It couldn't adorn her. It couldn't bring any honor to her as long as it was missing. And that's why she had to find it. It was just one piece of silver. But I'm going to tell you this, folk. It meant everything to this woman. Everything to her. Now, we understand tonight... Uh, that uh, the object of this parable is God is sending a message that every single one has value and every single one is important to Him. Uh, we understand that when God made us, He made us in His own image and likeness. And, and God um, desired to have fellowship with man. God desired to share His glory and the wonderful things of creation. And He wanted to, uh, to fellowship with man. Uh, but when uh, man sinned, that uh, that fellowship was broken and needed to be restored. That relationship was marred and needed to be restored. I'm glad, thank God, he made a way of restoration uh, through salvation. Uh, but when you think about it, that a life that's lived for the Lord is a beautiful and precious and powerful thing. Uh, but uh, whenever a lost soul is still in that lost condition, uh, that lost soul is not able to bring honor and glory to God, not able to... Uh, Feel that purpose that God has intended for it until, first of all, it has to be found. First of all, it has to be restored. It has to be cleaned up and it has to be put back in its proper place before it can ever bring honor and glory to God as God desires for us to be. I couldn't bring any honor and glory to God whenever I was lost and dead in my trespasses and sin. Uh, but God said, I got to go and uh, uh, redeem that young man. And it came to me in my lost condition at a young eight year old boy and saved me. And God forgave me and God cleaned me up. And uh, God's still working on me, still uh, molding and shaping me. Uh, but the only reason today that I'm able to do anything for the glory of God and able to do anything that's pleasing in his sight is because of the work that he's done in my life and the work he is doing in my life. What are you saying, preacher? I'm saying to God be the glory. The great things he's done, it's all because of him. Now for this woman, uh, her uh, uh, it was kind of a picture of incompleteness without this coin. But let me say tonight uh, that God is complete with or without you and me. Uh, that God is not dependent upon us, but God does love us and depends on us. But whenever we're saved by his grace and we've been cleansed by his precious blood, we've been filled by his spirit, uh, we've been put in our proper place, that we can adorn him and bring glory and honor that he deserves. Uh, when I read in Ephesians chapter number two, we see the before and after picture of salvation. And you hath he quickened, and ye hath he quickened who were dead in trespass and sin. The word quickened means to make alive. It talks about that we were by nature, children of wrath, even as others. And, and uh, we fulfilling the desires of the mind and of the flesh. And that was just the, the way of life. But God, uh, that he came and saved us and delivered us. We read on over in Ephesians chapter number 2, verse number 12, uh, that we are his workmanship, uh, that we are trophies of grace. There's a before and after. He talks about with the before that we were uh, strangers of the covenant of promise. We had no hope. We had no help. But now, thank God, we're in his covenant. Thank God tonight we do have hope and help. And it's all because of what he's done. <clears throat> we understand that this silver was precious. But we see secondly tonight uh, that when it comes to the search that it was precise. Look verse number 8. Either what woman having ten pieces of silver, if she lose one piece doth not light a candle, sweep the house, and seek diligently till she find it. We find the search was precise. When this woman realizes that this coin is missing, that she immediately, uh, that she moves into action. What does she do? She first thing she does is she lights a candle and illuminates the house so she can see better. Secondly, she gets to start sweeping the floor, those dirt floors in that day. Uh, then she starts looking diligently. Now, think about this. The reason that she had to light a candle is because the ways the houses were constructed in that day, they didn't have any windows, any natural light that came in, and it was a place of darkness. In other words, this coin was lost in darkness. Uh, we find that it was uh, uh, the dirt floors that she swept the floor. It was in the dirt, uh, but it was in the house somewhere. She just had to locate uh, where it was at. Now, you know, when you think about tonight, that pictures us outside a relationship with Jesus Christ. Did you know that before salvation that all of us was lost and that we were in our darkness? Matter of fact, there was no light in us at all. Uh, we couldn't find our way. We didn't know the way. We were, even though a person might be intellectually brilliant, uh, that the Word of God says that outside of salvation that we're spiritually blinded. Matter of fact, let me read to you a passage of Scripture found in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter number 4. 2 Corinthians chapter number 4, verse number 3. The Apostle Paul says, but if our gospel be hid, 
It is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is, in, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. You know what the Apostle Paul said? He said the way that we are able to uh, uh, take and help people in their lost condition is he said we have to have the light of the glorious gospel. You know what the light of the gospel will do? It will expel darkness. It will illuminate sin. Uh, it will show us where we stand. But thank God it doesn't just show us where we stand, but it shows us what Jesus did for us in order that he might redeem us. And God has that plan of redemption in place. Not only was we in darkness... Uh, but we understand that this coin was lost in the, uh, in the, the dirt. It's in the floor. Uh, in those days, those dirt floors, sometimes they were dusty. Sometimes they were hard-packed clay. Uh, but I can imagine that as she's looking, she's moving things around. And she's uh, taking a look in the floor. If it was a, a dust, that she's sweeping things around. If it was clay, that she's trying to uh, prick around and feel. Uh, why? Because she wants to find it. Uh, when you think about uh, that, uh, so it is with the lost. Uh, and by the way, now these coins, just like the coins we have today, our coins are stamped with a picture on them of somebody of importance of whatever period in history, and there's a lot of different people that are on the coins we have. In those days, the ruler of that area, whoever might be the ruler or the emperor, that their image also was stamped on those coins. And every time a coin was exchanged hands, and now that picture was seen, it was a reminder of who the ruler was, it was a reminder of who uh, that this coin was to uh, recognize. It was to bring honor to that one whose image was on it. Uh, but as long as that coin was hid in the dirt, uh, whoever's image on it didn't matter. You know what I'm saying? You couldn't even see it. Uh, even if it was found and say it was in the clay and it was in, and that image is there, but you can't see that image there until, first of all, you've got to remove all the dirt. What are you saying, preacher? Not only was we in darkness, but they also did not understand that we were in a mess. Our lives was upside down, that we might not have been in the dirt physically, but spiritually uh, we was in the dirt and we needed to be cleaned up. And the cleaning that we needed to take place couldn't take place in the baptismal pools of the uh, baptistry. That water can't wash away sin. Uh, what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. The songwriter said there's a fountain filled with blood drawn from me. Manuel's veins and sinners plunge beneath that flow. Lose all their guilty stains. And you know what happened? God one day uh, let the light of the glorious gospel begin to shine into our hearts. And he expelled that darkness and he reached out his hand in invitation and said that whosoever shall come, I'll in no wise cast out. And the Lord took and uh, drew us into him because he cared about us and cares about us. He saved us. And when he saved us, the first thing he did is start cleaning up our lives. Sometimes people tell me, said, preacher, I know I need to be saved and I desperately want to be saved. But when I get saved, I want to do it right. I don't want to be one of those hypocrites. I want to go all in for Jesus. I want to do it right. But I've got some things in my life I've got to get straightened out. I've got some things got to get straightened up. I've got to clean up some things. And I say, if that's what you're waiting on, you'll never be a Christian. Oh, why not? Because you cannot right your wrongs. Uh, you cannot take away one sin. Uh, you can't fix your problems. Uh, you can't change your life. You might can turn over a new leaf, but you can't get a new life. And what you've got to do is come to Jesus just like you are, filth, shame, reproach, everything you've got. Nothing in my hands I bring, but simply to the cross of Christ I cling and come to him as a broken, repentant sinner and saying, God, have mercy upon me. And I'll tell you what God will do. God will take your life and save you by his marvelous grace. And he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. He'll continue to clean us up and continually mold us and shape us. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away, and behold, all things are become new. Uh, anybody in here ever had your life changed by the power of God? If you've been saved, you've been changed. Amen? If you've been saved, you're still being changed. He's still working on us. Uh, that uh, the little boy said, uh, that uh, uh, talked about uh, the Lord, uh, uh, that uh, he's still working on me to make me what I ought to be. It took him just a week to make the moon and stars, the sun, the earth, and Jupiter and Mars. A song says, I know how impatient he must be, but he's still working on me. Amen. Uh, he's the potter and we're the clay. He's uh, taking and, and reshaping and molding. Uh, but when we find that not only was this coin in the darkness and not only was it in the dirt, but this coin was in the dwelling. 
was in the house. Did you know that you and I can find coins almost everywhere? I see sometimes people go up to the toll roads and they got to pitch the coins in and they throw a few in and realize they're short. They put it in park, they get out and they're looking under their seats. They're looking in the ashtray. They're looking in the glove box. Why? Because they know somewhere in that car there's got to be another coin somewhere and usually they find it and throw it in and they get to go and they're gone. Uh, you can find them at home, down in the furniture, and uh, you can find them out here around, uh, just walking around one day and find a coin there. Uh, you know, used to, I remember growing up, and it said, if you find a, a penny and if it's on heads, it's good luck, get it. I used to grab them up. Why? Because I wanted good luck until I found out there's no such thing as luck. It's providence of God. You know what I did? I started leaving them late. And then I thought, well, that's foolish too. Why? Because even though it's a penny, it still has a value. Right. Ten of them, you got a dime. Twenty-five of them, you got a quarter. That's as far as I can go without getting my calculator out. <laughs> what are you saying, preacher? I'm saying that when I saw one laying one day, I picked it up. And it wasn't about whose picture was on it, but it was about what it said on it. And it said, in God, we trust. And I remember picking that penny up and I said, you know, Lord, it's just a penny. And Lord, this penny is not going to change my life, but it's you that I trust. My faith's not in the economy and my faith's not in the money that I accumulate, but my faith is in you. And I prayed and I said, Lord, I'm reminded that even a small thing such as a penny has value when it's in your hands. And God, I have value as long as I'm in your hands. And I pray over it. I say, Lord, it's in you that I trust. Every time I find a coin on the ground, I pick it up and put it in my pocket. Not because I'm some uh, hoard or whatever, but it's because that I'm praying and saying, Lord, I'm reminded that every good and every perfect gift, the greatest of being that of salvation. Uh, uh, by the way, did you know there's lost folk everywhere? You and I can go up here at the little store on the corner. We can find lost folk. We can go down here at Walmart. We can find lost folk. We can go to the workplace, we can find lost folk. You pull up at a traffic light, there's lost folk going to be sitting around. They're, they're, they're everywhere we go. As a matter of fact, lost folk are not always just out there. There's times there's lost folk right here. In the house. In the very house. In the house. Lost in the house. Have you ever wondered what it might be like when the rapture takes place? How many people would be left behind from a... Bible-believing, fundamental, gospel-preaching church. He said, Preacher, why would you think something like that? Because the Word of God tells us to examine ourselves whether we be in the faith. Peter said, make your calling and election sure. Uh, there's uh, so many times we find that uh, there's those that was relying upon their religious works by the way, Nicodemus was a religious man and he came to Jesus in the midst of the night and Jesus didn't turn him away. Jesus took it and spent time with him. Why? Because he had some questions about uh, genuine salvation uh, and the Lord uh, dealt with him where it met the ru rubber met the road and explained to him uh, the parallel between the, the physical birth and the spiritual birth. I believe Nicodemus turned his heart to Jesus. What I'm saying tonight is there's a difference between religion and relationship. I know sometimes we as Christians, we get all uh, tightened up about terminology, but uh, I'm just going to be honest with you tonight. I'm opposed to the term that a religious person. You say, why, preacher? What's wrong with that? Because religion is man trying to get to God. And man can never get to God on his own. Don't matter what you do, don't matter how many churches you join, how many, much money you give, how many times you're baptized, or how many verses you quote, or how many uh, scriptural songs that you sing. It don't matter about that. The Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, for it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Uh, I'm not a religious person, but I'm a person that is in a relationship with the creator of the universe. And it's not because of what I've done, but it's all because of what he's done. My pastor said, if you've got to do something, you're too late. And I hate to disappoint you, but it's not a do, do, do salvation. It's a done, done, done salvation. When Jesus said it's finished, thank God it's finished. There's nothing to add to it and nothing to take away from it. You simply come to him by faith. I say praise his holy name. Amen. He made a way that every individual could be saved. 
Now this woman, she's got the mentality, whatever it takes. Verse number 8, lighting a candle, sweeping the house, seeking diligently. You know that she pictures the intense search of the Lord uh, whenever he's at work to redeem a lost sinner. Uh, wouldn't you agree tonight that God uh, uh, has a, uh, the picture, uh, the mentality of whatever it takes that they could be restored to my family? Whatever it takes. You know why I say that? Because God went to the greatest extreme lengths that you could ever go to to bring about salvation for every lost sinner. He gave his only begotten son. One time a person was so foolish and said, if God so loved the world, then if he's so concerned about mankind, then why didn't he die himself rather than giving his son? And I said, that's a picture of spiritual ignorance because the greater sacrifice was God's son. And secondly, you can't separate the Godhead that God in essentially died himself for our sin. Yeah. Amen? Right. In order to redeem us. Uh, when you think about he has given us his love, he didn't just declare it, but he demonstrated it. For God so loved that he gave the declaration, the demonstration. He uh, calls us to repentance and to come. He sends the message, and whether it be through somebody handing out a track or a billboard on the side of the road or a preacher proclaiming a message or somebody uh, singing a song or somebody coming and saying, hey, I just want to tell you that God loves you and that He cares about you and sharing the gospel, uh, that whatever it is that God sends a message by, that it's all because of His grace, just like whenever Philip was sent down there to speak to the uh, eunuch. Uh, uh, when we think about uh, He saves the whosoevers, uh, wouldn't you agree tonight? that God has went to the, the greatest lengths that there is to make sure that you and I could be redeemed to his family. He said, Preacher, I don't understand. It's just one piece of silver. It's only equivalent to one day's wage. Why is it such a big deal to her? Why does it matter? Do you know what? That's the mentality of society today, that society puts very little emphasis on individuals. If there's somebody that's in your family, if it's somebody in my family, somebody that uh, is our friends or somebody in our church, somebody this, that uh, we have a tendency to have more compassion and more concern about those individuals. But listen, if we're a true child of God, we're going to have compassion and concern about those that are not part of our family, those that are not part of our church, those that, uh, that are on the outside looking in, those that uh, lives are turned upside down and wrecked in sin. Why? Because uh, that Lord cares. And if the Lord lives within us, if the Holy Spirit lives within us, uh, don't you think tonight you and I to care just as well. Uh, I remember uh, when I was a young boy that uh, I'm an only child for those that don't know. And uh, that's what's wrong with me. Yes, I got an amen over here. Lord's still working on me and Miss Teresa's still working on me too. Amen. But I... I was accustomed not always to getting my way, but I didn't have to try to divide with other siblings. I was always around adults, and I felt like I was grown up even when I was a little young boy because I was always around adults. I wanted to work in the garage on the cars like everybody else. I wanted to do this like everybody else. I feel like I grew up. My grandma, she's on my dad. She said, you're ruining that boy because he has no childhood. He needs to play with toys and all this stuff. And my dad, uh, he took me with he went and, and all this. And, and I don't know if it hurt me or if it helped me or whatsoever, but that's part of my life. But you know, what happened was uh, by the time that I started getting in my teen years, I really thought I was somebody. I did. Why? Because I felt like I knew a whole lot of things a lot of people my age didn't know, and I'd been around a lot of stuff and all this, and there was a certain element of pride. That's a foolish young mind thinking. Whenever I got my driver's license, I was even more of a somebody than I had been because now I had some independence. Oh, and I remember I joined the military at 17, and I went off and and I went to training, and I was uh, from North Carolina, and I went up to Fort Dix, uh, New Jersey, and I was up there, and I was pretty much the only person from the South. Everybody else is from New York and, and uh, New Jersey and everywhere else, and I was the only one that had a funny accent. And every time I'd say something, I was pointed out and looked at for that. Not only that, but they took me in there and they cut all my hair off. And if you know how I cared about my hair, I always made sure it was in place and fixed it and all that. And they shaved my head bald. They stripped me of every bit of dignity I had. And I went from being a somebody to a nobody all of a sudden. As a matter of fact, that most people around there didn't even know my name. All the thing they knew was the last four of my social security number. I was stripped of everything I had. 
But even though those folk around there didn't know who I was, God in heaven knew exactly who I was. And boy, I found myself talking to him like a whole lot more than I had before. Amen. Needed him. Whenever I was uh, all working before and I'd go into some of the factories doing electrical work. And uh, I would say, uh, who do I need to see about this machine? And say, oh, go down there and see inspector number 10 or see inspector number 12. I'm like, don't these people have names? Well, I'm sure they probably do, but that's inspector 10, that's inspector 12. What else do you need? Why? Because society often puts little value on individuals. But with God, he puts value on every single individual. You and I will never, ever, ever look into the eyes or the face of somebody that God does not love. I don't care how bad they are. I don't care what sinful things they've done. I'm not trying to excuse any kind of terrible lifestyle and behavior, but what I'm saying is God loves us in spite of us. You'll never find anybody that God is not able to redeem. It's going to be up to them whether they accept him or reject him. But you'll never find anybody that God says, I'm not going to accept that one. God said, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And when I think about that, part of my prayer is, Lord, I pray that when I'm out around the crowds and the multitude, that I'd be able to see the harvest through your eyes. Lord, help me see past that person's sinful lifestyle. And see a person that's hurting, that needs help, that needs deliverance. Somebody that you love and care about. Somebody that you died for just like you died for me. Lord, help me have compassion upon them like you have compassion upon them. Little boy says, I go down there because they love you down there. Do we attract lost folk or do we repel them? Look at this and I'm done. That we find the silver was precious, the search was precise, but... The success was indescribable. We find in verse number 9, And when she hath found it, she calleth her friends and her neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I had lost. I tell you this, just like the, uh, the coin that lost sinners, we couldn't redeem ourselves, that we had to be redeemed. We had to be found. The song says, I'm glad I got lost so I could be found. I'm glad, thank God, that I've been found. Amen. Uh, we find that, uh, that, uh, that uh, with the Lord, that He claims us and delivers us from darkness, that He takes and He cleanses us and removes the filth and stain and dirt, and then He uses us in wonderful ways. Certainly there's calls for rejoicing. She causes her, calls her friends, calls her neighbors, and she says, come and rejoice with me that something wonderful has happened today, and I want you to be a part of it. They might come to her house and say, what's all the excitement about? She said, there's a coin lost, and I found it. And some of them might look and think, boy, she's done lost her mind. But the Word of God says this. Likewise, I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. Every time a soul gets saved, Heaven breaks out into rejoicing and celebration. Why? Because that which was lost has been found. Every time that a person that's a child of God who's drifted from God and life has got mixed up and messed up and they've backslidden and uh, they uh, take and God has convicted them and uh, they uh, uh, come to Him in confession. And First John 1, 9, if we confess our sin, He's faithful and just to clean, cleanse us of our sin, forgive us of all unrighteousness and cleanse us of all of our sin. We know that every time that happens, that a sinner repenteth, that heaven rejoices. Now, you know what happens sometimes to us Christians? Somebody come to the altar... And they'll make a profession of faith. And they'll say they got things settled in their heart. And sometimes we'll say, well, time will tell. We'll see. Time will tell. And many times you will see. But what I'm saying tonight is if heaven gets excited and rejoices, why in the world do we not get excited and rejoice? Do you know every time a person's saved, it's like a new baby being born into the family? 
You ever seen a family that sometimes gets down and kind of gets stagnant and, and there, there's like a, everything's the same old, same old. And then one day somebody comes in and says, well, I've got an announcement that I'm pregnant. Everybody's excited. Then whenever that child's born, you know what it does? It brings the family together. Everybody wants to come around that baby. Everybody's a wooing and on over that baby. Everybody's excited about that baby. Everybody wants to hold that baby. That baby's getting all kind of attention. Why? Because that new life has brought joy to the family. Could I tell you that we ought to do that for every single person that gets saved? Why? Because if we're truly Christians, that every time a sinner is birthed into the family of God, it brings new life. It brings a joy. It brings excitement. A baby don't automatically know how to live life. You've got to take time and train and, and teach and all that stuff. And so it is with a young Christian. You and I sometimes are guilty about... And throwing them out to the wolves whenever we ought to be bringing them in and discipling them and teaching them and working with them and showing them. Uh, babies don't get the first time, neither did we. But God's patient. And if God's patient with us, then why are we not patient with others? Sometimes we get frustrated because folk don't automatically become mature Christians overnight. We need to look back at where we were. And the time that it's taken for God to bring us from where we were to where we are. And I say tonight, I praise God for His marvelous grace. Amen. If you're here tonight and you don't know Jesus as your own personal Savior, I'm going to tell you this, that He loves you. and He cares about you more than you'll ever know. He wants you to be a part of His family. He wants to save your soul. He wants to give you new life, an abundant life. But it's up to you tonight whether you receive him or reject him. Let's all stand our feet. I'm going to ask Brother Jonathan to come around the piano and play something, whatever's on his heart.